Welcome back to this special with me, Phil Harding, talking about my journey through the 80s with Stock Aiken Waterman and PWL Studios. We're moving on to 1987. I've split this up quite deliberately into a chronological set of years because that's how my memory works, that's how my brain works, and that's how I've written my book, PWL from the Factory Floor. That's available on my website, philhardingmusic.com. So if you'd like to find out more, then please go to my website and make an order. 87 was, for me, a fantastic creative year at PWL. I'd formed a new production and remix partnership with my good friend Ian Kerno. He had joined in 1986 and Pete had expanded the studios. So I had my own studio, the Bunker Studio, and there was a sub-bunker studio below that where Ian came in and started running the Fairlight that I talked about before. And we really did begin to have a run of great dance records, pop records, crossing over in all sorts of places. So this one's a good example of that. The former backing singers and dancers to Wham, Pepsi and Shirley, this is Heartache. Yeah, reached number two in the UK charts, Heartache. That was the radio edit of the 12-inch mix that Ian Kerno and I did. One of many mixes and productions that we got into 1987 onwards. And I used to go out to the New York Seminar. That was a dance music conference in the 80s. And I went to a gay club out there one evening. 
And we must have had a run of something like five or six records that the DJ put together. Absolutely fantastic. And it peaked with the Pepsi and Shirley heartache there. So possibly the end of 85, this young lad arrived at the studio. I'm talking about Rick Astley. He introduced him as our next assistant T-boy and he was on a YTS scheme. Pete, we later found out, had seen him playing drums and singing in a band up in Warrington and persuaded Rick to come down to London and to spend some time at the studio. But interestingly, apart from Stock and Aiken, he didn't tell everybody else that. He just said, this is Rick, new T-boy, let him know how you like your tea. Milk, no sugar, please, Rick. (laughs) And, uh, and some months later, he said to myself and Ian, can Rick come down to your room and take a look at some of his ideas? Why don't you co-write some songs with him, get him into the flow of, of, of what we're doing here? So we did quite a few songs with Rick, and we had a release with Rick and Lisa as a duet called When You're Gonna that came out on RCA Records. And this next track, which we all know and hopefully love, was actually sitting on the shelf for nearly six months. And the version I'm going to play you now is an example of how a record builds up from maybe the first version or the second version. And Pete Waterman wasn't convinced by this version I'm about to play you, which I mixed, decided that it needed strings and brass and some more development, which Ian Kerner helped with. And we finished up with Never Gonna Give You Up, Rick Astley.
Rick Astley, what a guy. We all became really friendly with Rick because of the way that he came into the studio. And one of my little stories that I like to relay is that in 1986, Rick came to my stag do, which was in an East London pub across the road from the flat that I lived in. And I managed to persuade the landlord to let us stay after hours. There was a typical sort of East End pub, piano and a drum kit and a little PA in the corner. And Rick was playing drums at my stag do. There you go. <laughs> number one, all around the world, and number one in America. Just incredible. I mean, if things hadn't risen to a fantastic amount of hits and number ones, etc., etc., this really set a new high and a new standard for Stock Aiken Waterman and PWL. It wasn't on PWL Records. It was licensed to RCA Records. And we went on and had another album with Rick, and I'm going to play you a track from that second album. It was difficult for Rick. He was a solo artist going out and promoting this number one record, and the follow-ups were number ones as well off this first album. On his own, a lot of pressure, huge amount of pressure. Ian and I recorded possibly the last two tracks for Rick's first album, and when he came to do the vocal sessions, it was a real struggle, just because he was exhausted from travelling to America and Germany and Japan, and people don't realise what hard work it is promoting records. It's fantastic to have success, but that's why we see some artists not lasting the course. Okay, moving on to a fantastic act that Ian and I really got on well with. This is an act called Blue Mercedes and a record called I Want To Be Your Property. Therese, I Want to Be Your Property by Blue Mercedes. <laughs> 
uh, Ian and I had fantastic fun with the two guys, David Titlow and Miller. They were great. We did a whole album with them and they were good fun to work with. And I'm surprised they weren't bigger, but they were very popular in America in the dance charts. Although it only got to number 23, that track in the UK charts, Ian and I were delighted. But we're rounding off 87 with another number one. Okay, this time it's only a remix, but it really did help this record in the clubs. And it started, or reignited, I should say, a relationship with the Pet Shop Boys, who I'd worked with before. I'd co-produced a track called In The Night back in 85, when we started at PWL. And that was the B-side to Opportunities but it went on to become the soundtrack for the fashion show on TV. So their manager, Tom Watkins, who Ian and I did a lot of work with in the 90s, came to us and said, guys, you're the hot remixers in the clubs at the moment. We're aiming for number one for Christmas. And so this is the Harding Kerno remix of Always On My Mind, Pet Shop Boys. Yeah. 